Gobekli Tepe and the Mysteries of Turkey. You are listening to Brothers of the Serpent Podcast. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, angels and demons and monsters and servants. This is Brothers of the Serpent Podcast, and we are coming to you not live from the 10 by 10 by 10 Tangent Cube of Science, where we are nestled amongst the dusty bones of an ancient seabed high atop the Edwards Plateau once again after our trip to Turkey. Uh, we are going to be talking about that this episode. It was fantastic. It was a lot of fun. Two great groups came through. We were there for the whole thing. Uh, almost three weeks. Kyle's family went. Uh, great times were had by yes, all. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so, yes, uh, we have, you know, like we said on the show before we left, uh, you know, going there and seeing it and being in the place, like, really, it just, like, so many things become clear that just can't be clear from the armchair. Yep. Once again. <laughs> yeah. Holy crap. So. Totally freaking blew my mind, changed my mind. I went through many cycles. Yes. In the process. It's it's awesome. We're going to get into that for sure in yeah. detail, probably over the next two or three episodes at least. Yeah. Yes. Uh, at least the next two. I think we're going to have, we're planning, hopefully this will happen, to have Laura in uh, in studio with us for the next episode. And maybe we can just do that one live. I don't know. That, that would be fun. Be fun. Yeah. So maybe we can do that one live. Laura will be in the studio with us because she went. She was there for the first week. Yep. Uh, so that'll be great. And then after that, we have uh, maybe a guest coming up. I'm hoping so. Yeah. And then uh, and then we can do more turkey and then we'll continue on from there. We have an infinite number of shows heading off into the future right. that we can talk about stuff. But first... From deep beneath his secret space station in secret outer space, our buddy the Watcher is here with us. How are you doing, What's bro? What's up, dude? Um, I'm doing well, guys. It's uh, exciting times. Yeah, right to, to jump into a show. Right. And um, <laughs> I'd like to advise people also if you're on Telegram, you know, be creative with your group names. <laughs> yeah, and please. there's some nonsense that happened while I was here back stateside. And I got to send out a group that said, hey, have some bologna with your turkey to <laughs> Kyle and Lala. And that was great, right? So be creative with what you do on Telegram. You never know when you might need it. It'll be a good thing. Wait, fine advice. The, 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 the turkey puns, you know, they, they were rolling pretty strong. Yeah, there were while. turkey puns. Yeah. I, I must have missed this one. It's a bunch of gobbledygook. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was not a good one. I get it. I get it. <laughs> it's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, before we get started, yeah. we have uh, just a quick announcement to make about the Cosmic Summit. Obviously, people will know by now that uh, Graham Hancock has pulled out of the summit and there's just some, you know, people are all wondering, ah, what's going on? <laughs> uh, basically... Probably more information is going to be released on this, so the details of it. But we just want to say that um, Graham pulled out over a disagreement about contracts. That's what he stated. Uh, it was between him and George Howard. Yeah. And, you know, they had some personal disagreements. Um, it's unfortunate, but the summit is moving on. And also Jimmy from Bright Insight was let go. Yeah. For completely unrelated reasons. That's right. Uh, so that's basically it. I'm sure there's going to be more information coming out about it. But a lot of people were wondering and asking, you know, us what we knew. We are, you know, we know all the details, but we're not wanting to get into all the drama and all that stuff. It's just, you know, this is just one of those things when you're, I think, dealing with a lot of people, a lot of different minds, a lot of different artists, Scientists also being involved. It's a uh, high stakes. So uh, emotions run high and sometimes things go bad. But uh, I just want people to know that personally, I'm behind the Cosmic Summit. I think it's going to be a great thing. I'm looking forward to going. Uh, it's I, I wish Graham was going to be there. But, you know, it is what it is. We're, we're moving forward with it, and I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. It's going to be a good time. That's right. We, we stand behind George on this, on the summit. Like, yeah. I, you know, it is unfortunate what's happening. Um, you know, maybe it could have been avoided. I don't know. But, yeah. the, but the basic, 
when it co- what it comes down to is what Kyle said. Graham is not going to be attending. Jimmy is not going to be attending. And those two things are actually not connected. I know it looks like they are, but they're not. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> they were there. Graham is gone for completely different reasons than Jimmy. Um, and, you know, we're we're still in. As far as I know, Ben is still in. You know, everybody else who was on the speaker list is still in. And we're getting or George is trying to get new people, I think, uh, for to to fill those other spots. So. Yeah, it looks like he's already got two people yeah. uh, agreed to join. So it's still going to be good. Yeah. Um, and we're going to the, be there. It's going to be fun. The good news is that some of the people that specifically bought tickets to see Graham or to see Jimmy <laughs> are getting refunds. So tickets are going to be available. Again. Right. People have like purchased tickets today because this happened. Because yeah. people are getting refunds because they just were going to see Graham or just going to see Jimmy. So yeah. if you wanted to go and you couldn't get a ticket because it sold out so fast, now's the time to look. Yep. So that's good news. Yeah. <laughs> and there may be room opening up in the hotel as well. I heard that there was uh, yeah, no I'm, rooms available. I'm sure so. there's going to be. So uh, if you had a ticket and you didn't have a room in the hotel, you may be able to get one now. Call the hotel. Yeah. Also, I'll just say this about, I think, you know, I feel like I know George pretty well. And the goal, I know that his mission in this whole thing with the Cosmic Summit, and he's said it a million times, is this idea of bringing... The scientists together with the speculators. He kind of came came up with this label about people like us or Ben or, um, you know, Graham Hancock. <clears throat> we're we're not scientists. Uh, ben might actually be a scientist, but <laughs> it's possible that Ben is actually a scientist. <laughs> uh, In disguise, we're, we're yeah. definitely speculators, <laughs> and it's it's. I just think it's a great idea and a good thing for you know, this message of the possibility of alternative models of history. Um, There's going to be some really uh, well-published scientists there that are going to give talks on, you know, their whole field and everything that they've got going on. It's, I I just think it's going to be fantastic to bring these two groups of people together. So um, I think it's a, a wonderful goal and I hope it, goes through without a hitch, you know, in, in the actual any production. More. Of any more hitches. hitches. <laughs> um, and I hope it continues on annually, which is, which is the plan. So that is the goal. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and I hope it grows. And actually we, <clears throat> we, uh, when I met with George in Asheville, we looked at another venue, um, that can hold a lot more people and it's a great space. So there's a possibility if if this thing can grow that it could be much bigger and and uh, at a place that can house everybody. Yeah. So and the other great thing about this is, you know, if you guys want to show up and party with me, now's the time because this on this event I only have to work for one hour. <laughs> Kyle is probably going to be working the entire time, dude. I so, I quit. Show up and party with me. <laughs> 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 I signed up to sweep floors, and those floors are too fucking dirty now. <laughs> I'm not sweeping them anymore. <laughs> Kyle's actually involved in the production, so he's going to be running around with cable problems, well, like monitor issues. He's going to be talking to the AV guys. <laughs> I only have to work for one hour, <laughs> so I will be partying and drinking beers with you guys the rest of the time. I will be, too. I can totally <laughs> run AV while partying and drinking beers. No, I'm not actually running it. I was I was organizing it. So, Which means you're going to be, like, doing everything that Probably. they can't do. <laughs> they, they, they can do everything. These guys are professionals. Yeah, I know, I, I know. I got this awesome team of people that I'm very excited about. So, uh, But, yeah. Hey, I'm, listen, I, team of guys. <laughs> you need to make sure Kyle's busy. Because... <laughs> <laughs> Just give it like, hey, bro, Fine. send him, send him to some different distant place <laughs> for like the left-handed plug or whatever, <laughs> just to make sure that he's busy. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> no, it's great, uh, but yeah, it's it's gonna be fun because normally on the, uh, you know the, all the other events we do, um, I'm working a lot. Like I, I get to go or whatever, but I'm constantly in this mode of like I'm actually on a job. You know, so this will be fun because I am going to present, but other than that, I'm just an attendee, you yeah. know, so yeah. it's going to be great to hang out. Yep. It's going to be good. All yeah. right. Turkey. Yeah. What do we got? 
Sandwiches. Sandwiches. Turkey. Sandwiches. Turkey. Sandwiches. Sandwiches. Well, uh, I would like to say, yeah. Well, Russ got the Russ got the shirt. I got I, the yes. I don't the, think this shirt's going to age well. Extremely expensive hoodie, which I'm sure if you're watching the video, you can see it. it says the world's and first everyone, yeah, temple. Everyone was telling me in the group they were like, "Bro, it's already wrong." Yeah, <laughs> it's already wrong. Carhan uh, Tepe. But is listen, old. I didn't have a choice. <laughs> My <know>. hoodie <laughs> got stolen. That's right. You know who you are. Yes, stolen. So yes. I had to purchase a hoodie. There was on a site. spy <laughs> involved. <laughs> um, so yeah, I would like to say our. Uh, I, I just want to give a shout out to my bro, Ramazan. Ramazan over there in Turkey. He is our brother. Yes. Yeah. Our mother left him in the river <laughs> when right after he was born. A long time ago, abandoned him, and uh, he's our long lost brother. That's basically. right. We we've. Reconnected. We re reunited, <laughs> yes. And, you know, our parents went on this trip. And so they, we basically have adopted him they into the family. They admitted it. Yeah. <laughs> they were like, yes, he is our son. <laughs> Welcome home, son. <laughs> we had, I mean, he was just great, uh, our, our guide over there. Um, so big shout out to him. Yep. And his, and his family. Um, man, where do we start? Sean Lurfa. The city that we went to, uh, we were based in the center, what they called city center, so downtown. Uh, it was an old, yeah, old whatever, and lovely sure. hotel in the middle of the city, basically surrounded by these beautiful, like this beautiful park that incorporates multiple uh, sacred sites. So you could just walk out of the hotel, go down some stairs, pass a little cafe. And right there is this massive maze-like bazaar, you know, mm. which was fun. I mean, that thing was just fun to wander because you could go in there and get lost. And there's just shops, uh, just like tiny and little alleyways. We're planning on releasing some videos, uh, some short videos about what we thought, what we saw that are going to be more concise. And those will those will include a, a lot of the pictures and videos that we took. Um, and maybe I can stick some here in post as well just to show you guys a little bit uh, on the YouTube channel. But there's also what they called Fish Lake. Uh, interesting legends surrounding that. It wasn't really a lake, you know, mm -hmm. but there definitely were fish. <laughs> but the whole thing is now, you know, you can imagine maybe it was um, a long time ago. Maybe it was natural, but now it's a basically... spring or something. Yeah, that there may have been a, a body of water there that was natural, but now it's all sort of canaled and channeled mm -hmm. in and contained within brickwork and rockwork or whatever. Uh, of course, there were many mosques. Uh, some of the mosques contained in them very ancient caves that are associated with legends about certain... Uh, patriarchs. Yes, and patriarchs, biblical and Quranic figures. Uh, so that was, that was interesting. Uh, the whole city, really, is just filled like... <clears throat> there was an ancient castle on a hill in the center of the city. We walked up there several times, and from... That level or that vantage point, you can basically look out and see the whole city unfolding and like it just rolling through these uh, limestone hills. And the hills are just cr filled with ancient caves. Yeah. They call them caves, them. but they're really rock cut. They're rock cut tombs or whatever. Yeah. yeah. There's a and whole there's a whole <laughs> section of cliffside with, uh, with, you know, the, the tombs of the um, uh, tombs of the nobles, kind yeah. of. It nobles was, and kings yeah, and whatnot. Yeah. People who were wealthy. Uh they got buried on this one section, and that's that section is still preserved. So you see all these buildings, all these houses and stuff, and there's this one cliffside with all these holes in it uh, in the middle of the city that, you know, it's just rock and greenery and, and tunnels entering into it. And then everywhere else you looked, you see all these houses, and then in some places there's an ancient quarry up there, or there's, like, entrances into the hillside. All this stuff is old, but it's still being used today. So you see that... The layering, you know, this is the thing about like in Egypt, like if you're in Cairo, uh, it's d if there's ancient ruins under Cairo and there probably is, I mean, people still find stuff. It's, it's, got, it's hidden. It's yeah. buried. Right. But yeah. here it's a very interesting mix of like the modern stuff. And then this ancient stuff just kind of right next to it or sticking out of it, you know, and Ben was saying it's like Cusco, like you would see this in Cusco, like modern construction on top of. You know, yeah, like yeah. construction that's a thousand years old on top of stuff that's really, really old. Yeah. Um, so that was, that's Shunlurfa. And of course, this place was hit bad by the earthquake and also the flood that happened later. Uh, but they're recovering nicely. 
Um, we still we saw damage, um, but you know people were going on about their business. Yep. Um, we were there in the middle of Ramadan, <laughs> <That's right. laughs> which made things interesting. The beer runs were uh, you know were epic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. we uh, there was only one beer store open, and uh, we had to make multiple runs there with suitcases to fill them with the beers and bring it back to the hotel. And, you know, trying to be respectful also of Ramadan, you know, we were asked like, hey, you know, just don't don't be drinking this out in public uh, or even like publicly in the lobby of the hotel. So we kind of had this little room in the back yeah, uh, where we would all gather in the evenings and hang out. The infidel room. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's what we were calling it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was great. Um should I, should I have not said that? No, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It's funny. Um, but yeah, it was just, uh, again, great groups of people, uh, wonderful people, had had uh, a great time with all of them uh, exploring the sites. And it just, um, like Russ was saying, like the, there's so much there. And, and this is one of the things that I kind of sort of came away with in general is that I, I feel like the archaeology – in this part of the world is just, it's really, uh, it's just getting started thin on the it, ground. It, yeah, yeah. It seems like there's just so much there. Like we went to, you know, Haran, which is this, you know, this, uh, city in the middle of a giant plain and it's sort of a hill in the middle of the, of the plain or valley or whatever. And it's just I mean, just piles of rubble as far as you can see and just, you know, stones sticking out of the ground everywhere. And it's like they've got one place that's fenced off where they've done a couple of oh yeah, digs in there. And you can see when you look down into the into the dig area, that's just it just goes down and down and down through all of this mud brick and every all of these other stones and just piles of whatever. And then it gets down and then there's foundations that way down there. Yeah. There's just so much underground here that has not been discovered and of course you know um up up north in in Cappadocia we didn't we didn't get to go there but there's they've they've found all these underground cave systems and everything I felt like there's a couple of places we went when you could go down into some of these rock cut sort of tombs and they just they're interconnected with other ones it just keeps going yeah and then there's shafts going down and you're like man I look down in the hole and there's just a pile of rubble in the shaft it's like Yep. This needs to be excellent. It has a second level down. Like, yeah. <clears throat> it could just keep going. So yeah. there's so much to be discovered here. And it's true also when it comes to uh, Gobekli Tepe and Karahan Tepe. These are, these are massive sites, uh, each one. Like Gobekli Tepe is huge, and it's just a tiny little portion of it has been excavated and studied. Uh, there's so much in that one site, and yet... Around Turkey, they've at least confirmed 40 other sites like it. Yeah. We were told 40, it may be 80. <clears throat> I wouldn't be surprised. It's, it's, <sighs> both numbers were said. So it's not clear. There's at least 40 other sites like Karahan and Gobekli. So, yeah, different from Egypt in that Egypt for, for, uh, centuries has had like major archaeological work, even if it wasn't necessarily archaeological yeah in the beginning still people have been digging there and and <clears throat> searching for you know new sites and all that there's there's so much archaeology being done in egypt it's the birthplace of archaeology essentially um whereas in turkey it's just completely the opposite it's like this place has barely been touched yeah by archaeology Compared to what's what's there, yeah. So, and in some places that that makes it interesting because the only story that they have about the site is whatever the local legends local are. Local legends. There's no book, there's, stories from the the ancient texts. Yeah. Uh, there's not necessarily like an archaeological overlay to some of the sites we went to see. There's just like here's what they say about this well. Yeah. Right. Here's what they say about this particular hole in the in the side of this limestone right. cliff. You know, that Here's Abraham lived here or, or Jethro was here or yeah. somebody was born here, right? You know, the story about Fish Lake, which is interesting because this is one of the, you know, it's th this idea that he was going to be burned and he was put on the fire and the fire turned into water and the logs for the fire turned into fish. And now you have Fish Lake, right? And you're like, what is the symbolism? Like there's, mm -hmm. there's interesting yeah. things yeah. happening in the story here. 
Uh, and the, you know, the water and the fish are considered sacred and people are all up walking up and down the, the, the banks of this lake. You know, it's all, it's all like stone walkways and they're feeding the fish and there's, there's thousands and thousands of them, yeah. you know, and they're, the fish are considered sacred and so is the water. So it's like, uh, it's just, it's just very interesting. Whereas in Egypt, everywhere you go, you know, you may have whatever the local legends are just completely overshadowed by the Western archeological story yes. of each site. Uh, so also a lot of this, you know, what we saw was, was made into limestone. Like I, I'm trying yeah. to rack my brain. Did I see any granite artifacts? We saw like, basalt. We saw basalt, but artifacts. it was, but it was more like uh, grinding stones or, yeah. right. Yeah. I don't remember seeing any basalt Like blocks. Neolithic stuff. Right? Yeah. 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 Uh, so really the, the only symbolism that I can remember other than just like a few rudimentarily carved, there was some stuff in that quarry we looked at. Yes. You know, there were little symbols carved in the side of this limestone, but limestone, of course, when it's exposed, uh, wears down pretty quickly, Yeah, you know, compared to granite. So that's what sets Gebekli Tepe apart from a lot of these other sites is that there's actually a lot of symbolism in the site. And, uh, it's, it's, it, because it was buried, it was preserved. So there's just in, in a lot of the ruins that we went to, you're just walking around and there's just blocks, you know, just piles of cut limestone blocks that used to be stacked up in some way, you know, hard to figure out. Uh, there's some places where, the archaeologists, like in Haran, where they're actually reconstructing some of the city elements, they have a map of what they think the city looked like. Um, and the tower, there's a tower in the center that is like, there. it's partially rebuilt, but it, it at least we were told that a large, you know, a, a respectable portion of it has remained, even though most of the city is just rubble. And so, of course, there's now like... There's Tower of Babel legends about yeah, yeah. it. And just, you know, all the stories are very interesting. <laughs> it's cool. Yeah. What a cool place. Definitely yeah. going back. And before wait, before I forget, I wanted to give a shout out to Wish and Gabe. Oh, yeah. Thank you guys so much for coming. It was great to see you. Wish has been, you know, listening to the show for a long time. We had her on as a guest. She was able to come with her son. They were they were great fun. And uh, and they are givers of awesome gifts. That's right. The yes. T-shirts. We got excellent T-shirts. <laughs> and I got uh, we got a very, very um, interesting and valuable book from her as well. Mm. A Petri book. Oh, an old one. So, oh, yeah. wow. Yes. I missed this. I must have been. Yeah, there was very, that a very room. secret uh, okay. transaction. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> very cool. Well, yeah. the t shirts are awesome. Yeah. Giant Triangle Ramp Company t shirts. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Giant Triangle Ramp Company. <laughs> Genius stuff. And we did. We did jam a little bit of satanic folk, right? Just a little. <laughs> we rocked out some satanic folk with her son. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, he's a, he's a good musician. Yeah, he is. He's yeah. Cool. He's got a great style. Yeah. Um so yeah, generally wonderful trips, definitely planning on going back. Uh there's a lot more to see like we were saying. We we definitely want to get up north. Yeah, we're tuning the tuning the tour. Um mm -hmm. we talked to Ramazan about this pretty extensively. Uh he is very interested in working with us in the future and Ben, of course. Um we love doing this stuff with Ben. It's just it's perfect for us. So I also want to give a shout out to Ben. Thank you so much for including us on this. And, uh, you know, the whole bro. thing was great. Like working with you is always, I mean, it's just, it's so easy. Uh, Ben is a great, he's very professional. Basically, despite the, I'm in the, charge, the right? many things that he does that aren't professional, he <laughs> is extremely <laughs> professional. <laughs> we, but all of us had many, uh, you know, like uh, what we called profesh moments. On this trip. Like, <laughs> yeah. Yes, I forgot my camera. I did not charge this thing. Um, but yeah, this was, it was great working with Ramazan and Ben and we're, we're planning on doing future ones and Ramazan wants to extend them to make them longer so that we can move cities, go up North, yeah. go to, you know, go to the, is it Phrygian Valley? I don't remember. Uh, like the Phrygian cap. This mm -hmm. is where the, this is where, you know, Cappadocia, this is, and then the cart ruts are there. Hopefully we can get to see those. Uh, but, uh, Ramazan works with people in the government. So he's able to sort of kind of make things happen. Um, he doesn't, that's not his region, but he's interested in, uh, cause we told him, we're like, bro, we got to get here. Like, this is one of the things, mm -hmm. you know, and he's like, okay, we can make this happen. So <clears throat> we're definitely working with him in the future and hopefully the, the future tours will be, uh, 
more extensive. The other thing, I did want to mention this, because of the damage from the earthquake and mostly the flood in this case, the museums were closed. And so we weren't able to get in and see all the artifacts that have been taken from Karahan and Gobekli. And I really feel like this is a big missing piece of the puzzle. Like, you know, mm -hmm. going to Gobekli Tepe now, at least, cause I've, you know, all of us have seen pictures from when it was still being worked on extensively and it was basically out in the open. So you're able to see the sun interacting with the T pillars and the carvings on them. And now the whole thing is under this massive like, uh, cover. This is a very interesting architecturally designed cover. It looks like a giant sail and the top of the wind at the top of the hill is very windy and you're just waiting for the thing to just take off like a UFO. <laughs> <laughs> but it seems to be well constructed, but of course yeah. they, they, who knows what they did to the archeological site because they drew, drove these pylons deep into the ground all around it to into hold the, the bedrock, to yeah. anchor the thing in. Yeah. So it's, <laughs> it's done damage to the site itself, but they also think that they're protecting it from the elements. I have to agree. I'm, I think, yes, I, I I had one view of it based on what, you know, Graham Hancock complaining about it, which I, I totally understand that as well. It's like, you know, he's it like, disconnected they, they from the disconnected sky. Disconnected it from the sky. Yeah. I, I get that. Yep. It's 10% of the site. Right. And the, the, the thing about it is that limestone, it <clears throat> definitely wears when it's out in the open. Yeah. It, it, you know, depending on the pH of the rain and all this kind of stuff, it can just like wear these beautiful carvings down, the lichen will grow on them, uh, all kinds of things. And I feel like they did do a good thing here by covering it up. Uh, they have another site right next to it that they're working on, and it's also got a giant UFO-looking cover yeah. over it. Uh, yeah. So they're, they're pre-protecting the sites now just to dig in them. So The other thing is is that this site is dug so deeply down through the, the sediment it's, it's not really set. I mean, some of it's sediment, midden. but through the midden that it's basically surrounded by retaining walls. And some of these retaining walls are very ancient. Yeah. They're 10,000 years old. Yeah. And some <laughs> of them have been reconstructed by the archaeologist or they yeah. piled up, you know, cement bags to hold back. If this thing was exposed to the elements, it would constantly be washing materials in. down into the... Yeah, I agree. It's probably still doing that, but yeah. the roof is going to do a lot to protect... Yes, uh, keeping the water off of it for sure. Yeah. And like they had that flood, they probably would have been pools if oh. it hadn't been covered. It would have been a nightmare. Yeah. Um, and just the amount of rubble, that, I mean, it would have collapsed walls and all oh, that yeah. kind of stuff. It's just. Yeah. I mean, even as it was, you could see places where stuff like fine sediments have been washing in even yeah. from being protected. And, you know, and now it's growing grass down in there and they got to get in there and clean all that stuff out of there. And so. I did. I, I also appreciated the walkway around it. I mean, yeah, it, it was, kind of floats you around the site. Yes, you're standing above it where if 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 that structure wasn't there, you know, you'd be way back on the bank. Yeah. And too far away from the site and then to try to get, you know, thousands of people over the course of time down into these enclosures just yeah. I can totally see how this would be a nightmare. Yeah. Um so I I I think architecturally it's it's beautiful it's uh, it seems to be well designed and and just for the purpose of being able to get as close to the site as possible it, it was great and to look down on it you can you know it kind of like we said if, if the walkway is a big circle everything everything that's designed around the Gobekli Tepe visitor center uh, is all it's all it's these all big circular, circles circular, they've, they've circle kind of like yes they've things. adopted this like enclosure sort of uh, imagery so everywhere you go, the buildings are all big circles or you're walking through this circular hallway yeah. or whatever. And the yes, the visitor center is interesting. That whole... <laughs> Very disappointed. Sorry. <laughs> what do you mean? I just realized when I was there that all of the artifacts they have in there are replicas. They're not even... Yeah, they're replicas. Yeah. There's a couple that are nice, but like decent replicas. But then they had like, you know, flint artifacts and all this kind of... They're just total fakes. They're not even replicas. Like, they didn't even get the lithics right. Yeah. And I was just like, what the hell? This is completely wrong. You don't think that, uh, what was it, the fox head or whatever was real? a real No, artifact? those are not real. Okay, they're replicas not, for yeah. sure. Yeah, they're cast. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that makes sense. All the real ones are in the museums, which we didn't get to go see. So this is tying back to what I was saying. The museums were closed. They were being flooded. So they, like, we were told by Ramazan that they just had this emergency and they moved 
30 or 40,000 artifacts out of the museums because the museums were filling with water. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so all the artifacts that were in the museums are in boxes stashed in multiple different places and they haven't finished fixing the museums and then restoring the artifacts to their, to their displays. So, uh, yeah, but otherwise, you know, it's, it's for Gubekli Tepe, like for pretty much compared to everywhere else you go. The site of Gubekli Tepe is very well oh, designed yeah. and built. And Everything it's is beautiful. Beautiful. It's, 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 it's clean. Great. Yes, it's 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 amazing. <clears throat> yeah, I just had to complain about the freaking arrowheads in the. Yeah, museum. and I'm complaining about we didn't get to go to the museum. That's what I was trying to do: is I complain understand. that we didn't get to see real artifacts. And you just made it worse by telling me that even those like five artifacts <laughs> that I did see are <laughs> They're fake. They're fake, bro. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. Well, I want my money back. <laughs> Those? Let's take a break. We'll come back and yeah, keep right. talking about this. All right, fine. <laughs> well, you're done complaining. Yes, you're right. I'll stop complaining. <laughs> I have nothing to complain about, really. <laughs> it was great. back ladies and gentlemen brothers of the serpent podcast returned from the land of sandwich meat <laughs> fantastic trip no complaints right that's right no complaints <laughs> uh we are, we are definitely working on um Ooh. Like Russ said, a video with that's going to include, uh, you know, all of our uh, organized thoughts and things about the sites. That's right. Uh, or multiple videos, probably, but at least we're starting with one. But I would like to still get into those details now. Just spill the beans. I don't care. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm all about riffing on it. Yeah, and yeah. Before we do that, thanks to... Sir Andy and Dame Kylie for sending us some goats. Yeah. In the morning to you, buddy. Thank you for your courage. Yeah. Cheers. Cheers. Ah, very enjoyable beer. <laughs> goats. <laughs> Go. <laughs> so, yeah. Did you have a note from him you were going to read? I do. I was going to do it at the end when we do the... Oh, okay. Uh, All right. There is a note that goes with the beer. It will yep. be read by the He sent the us a whole one-up box. Oh, okay. So I, I'll get... We'll do that at the end. But, uh, I mean, I told... I, I did not know there was a one-up box you going You got to drink there. beers during the show. I'm not going to wait to the end to drink this beer. Clearly not. Clearly not. Yeah. No, that, no that's, he, that's he good. Knows. He knows. Thank you, buddy. <laughs> So, so yeah, I, I well will, yeah let me let, let me ahead. just let me just go ahead and say that um, and maybe we already talked about this I can't remember but when we ca when we got back from the last Egypt trip uh, we decided that uh, we wanted to start making some more uh, produced videos short ones uh, about some of our thoughts that are developing about some of these places we've gone and si especially now that we have lots of video and fo uh, photos of our own that we can use, and then we have our own insights. Um, uh, a lot of those insights have developed through discussions on the show, discussions with each other off air, uh, discussions with Ben on air and off, uh, and then with many of the attendees at the various trips. Um, so we are working on that. We have two of them in the works right now, and one of them we started as soon as we got back, which is basically uh, about our an, an overview of our trip to Turkey. Um, it's, it's a whole different kind of work than we do with the podcast. Uh, but I think it will, it's gonna It's a lot of fun and it is going to augment, um, the whole, just the entire brothers of the serpent enterprise. Um, yeah. so we're really looking forward to that. So yes, we, Kyle has been doing a lot of research. Uh, I haven't done as much as him. <laughs> He's definitely done some deep dives into this stuff. For the turkey stuff, I I have done some reading on it though, and I'm I need to catch up to where he's at. But uh, this he's written this script for this uh, 
for this turkey video, and it's fantastic. And you oh, know, thanks, bro. Most of the most of the th these things that are going to be in it, we've been discussing with each other. Uh, and yes, I'm fine with going over them. It's not like we're spilling the beans on ourselves. We can't scoop ourselves, right? <laughs> uh, and I think that uh, yes, uh, yeah, I just don't want it to change the the natural element of this part of the show because I have all this stuff I want to say. Yeah, you're like, oh, I got to keep it secret because it needs yeah, to go no, in the video. I no, don't, I don't. No. <clears throat> Don't want to do that. No, and I think that those kind of videos are just going to be for, I mean, obviously people who listen to our podcast are probably going to watch them, but it's also going to appeal to a totally different audience. Yeah. So there's going to be plenty of people that watch that video that don't listen to the podcast. So so where do you want to start with that? Do you want to, just, did, did you want to finish talking in general about what we saw sure, in, in Turkey? Yeah, because the uh, Sogmatar was amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is a place that uh, it's also very ancient. Very little archaeology is being done there. Um, uh, if you know of Chuck's videos, CF Apps on YouTube, who passed away recently, uh, he has videos on it. And he talked about how he thinks the central hill, there's this massive central mound. It's amazing because... All around, this is the other thing, and I don't, I don't want to get too sidetracked. This is, we're tangentizing here, but... Seeing the context of the landscape for some of these sites was really important when, you know, going there. Like, for example, with Gobekli Tepe, seeing where it is in the landscape is just a big, it's a big deal. Uh, there's plenty of, of photos of the site itself, but, you know, when you're standing there looking up, you're like, okay, it's, the, the landscape around it is just these massive limestone hills, the tops of which are mostly bare stone, uh, and so, like, why did they choose to build this thing way up here on top of this hill is very important. So Sogmatar is like that. It's this rolling limestone landscape. There's very few trees anywhere. It's, like, grassy in the spring. At least we were there in the spring, and it was beautiful green because they had had all the rain. There's flowers. But Ramazan said mostly it's usually the grass is very short. It's usually yeah. yellowish or brown, you know. Yeah, I've seen lots of pictures. Yeah. It's so we were there. It's a, we, it was sort of special. It it's was very green. It was special, and I think it even put into stark contrast the difference in in you know like if it was all more desert, yeah, sort of you know burned grass and all that kind of stuff, it would have been more difficult to see the difference in these between the normal landscape and these occupation sites. So yeah. at Sagmatar, rather than being up on top of a hill, the main mound there is actually in a valley right uh this 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 river valley it's now dry river many of the rivers are just they're just dry. dry yeah it was it would have been an island you know in sort of like a what is it called now i can't remember the term for it but a um distributary you yeah. know the river would have come and split and then come back together around this huge mound and it's you know when we were there it's just this beautiful green yeah because it's covered, it's got so much soil on it. It's got so much material on it that it can support plant lots of plant life. Whereas the hills around it are just bare uh, for the most part. There's grass growing in the cracks in the rocks and all that kind of stuff. But at the very tops, it's almost no vegetation whatsoever. It's pure bedrock sticking out. Yeah. And there, that site was cool because it had this central mound. It really looks like a pyramid. I mean, it's round, but. There are places it doesn't where look anything like the surrounding hills. No. I mean, it's completely man-made, in my opinion. Yeah, now, it's there, totally man-made. There may be a, you know... It, it's so huge. ...primordial mound under it. Right. It's the original bedrock, but... Yeah, surely. But it's so huge that you, your mind is telling you that this is a natural hill. And it's, you know, it's it's rounded. It's covered in dirt. Like Kyle was saying, there's there's grass and flowers growing on it, at least when we were there. But, but I knew everywhere you see on the mound, there's blocks sticking out of yeah. it. <laughs> I knew immediately we were approaching the site, and I'm like, yeah. that's man-made. That's that man-made. entire freaking hill is man-made. Yeah. And you can see, like he's saying, there's cut blocks sticking out all over the place. On, on one side, there's very large, respectable constructions sticking out yeah. of the side of it. Like what like, looks more like castle walls or something than a pyramid. But interesting but large angles. Blocks, and yes, weird angles. Yeah. Like like at Sacsayhuaman, the, the walls, how they have these weird yes. jagged angles. It was like that on one side. There's just yeah. huge walls sticking out. Kind of reminds us of... Um, like the Black Pyramid or, you know, yeah. in Egypt, there's these these mud brick pyramids. Yeah. And they're just basically melting. It looks yeah. like this rounded mound. 
but then there's just huge limestone angular blocks sticking out sticking from the out. core masonry of right. this thing. Yeah. That's kind of what it looked like. That's right. Yeah. It was it was awesome. And there's one little sort of uh grid area on one side of it where archaeologists have been doing some digs and of course you can see like well they've dug down, you know, 5 10 feet and they've exposed some rough stone cobble rock walls in yeah. there and various things like that. Looks very similar to a lot of the same sort of cobblestone wall construction at Carahan Tepe, Gubeco Tepe. This is PPNA stuff. Is that what you're saying? I'm, I'm curious. I haven't seen any papers on it, right. but I haven't looked. I've but it's busy. similar to the yeah. It's, so it's this just is, yeah. I was looking at the construction. I'm like, this is this is the same sort yeah, of so rock wall, and they're and they're digging sort of towards the bottom of the mound. Right. Yeah. They're they're digging into this because people have been saying, and Ramazan was telling us, people have been saying that the whole thing is what single construction. He said that based on this tiny amount that the archaeologists have dug into, that they think it's layers of occupation, which is, I mean, it's it seems obvious that that's yeah. what it would be. Like, in other words, that the thing is not a single building, but that right. many, many buildings and possible multiple structures sometimes, and then other times a single structure have been built on top of this over and over, and they crumble, and then eventually somebody comes and builds more things, and then you end up with this right. giant hill. That's what they say they're finding just by this little amount that they've dug into the side mm. down near the bottom. Wow. That, it, and that in other words, it's layers of cities. Not, well, yeah. it's, it's not big enough to be a city, right? It can't, you can't call it a city, but maybe no, a- No, but like a fort or like a fort, some kind of yeah. outpost or right. whatever. Now, surrounding this thing in sort of a semicircle, way out on the distant hilltops are, you know, quote unquote temples. Yeah, These multiple small, small buildings. Temples. One of them is is- Circular, beautifully circular hewn blocks. Every block is like curved on the outside and they, you know, they... It looks like a cistern, but it's... Yeah, they made like wedge-shaped blocks to sort of... Yeah, it's, yeah. it's just it's beautiful construction. Underneath it, there's a cave dug, you know, a rock cut yeah. thing dug straight into the bedrock. We went to one of the other ones. It's a little more seeming like square construction, but I mean, just a pile of blocks and yeah. like an archway sort of sticking out of it or whatever. And I've climbed so many of those in video games. When we were <laughs> there, I was like, was? this is just like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then and you see in that one, there's this <laughs> cut going down into the bedrock and it's just rubble falling over it. And you can see a hole and look yeah. down in there and there's, it, yes, there's exactly. a cave under there. Yeah. So it's um, a lot of similarities across these. And each, each temple up on these hills had its own uh, quarry. Yes. A little quarry site on the side of the hill that, that, you know, was maybe what, you know, 25 yards away from the building site. They right. just were they quarrying been blocks straight out of the hill. Extracting rock directly from the hill and then stacking them up into the little temple thing. And very these were, cool. it was seven of them, right? Supposedly. Supposedly, yeah. Yeah. And you would like make they were supposed people, to represent the planets. You're supposed to make a pilgrimage, the planets or the Pleiades, whatever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's like a pilgrimage thing. You walk to each one, uh, you know, going around this central mound. One of the things that Ramazan is really suggesting that we do. When oh we yeah, go back is like take a small group of people. Yeah, walk and, from Sagmatar. To, yes, you you go to Sagmatar or you go to Karahan Tepe or whatever, and you walk, walk to the other one. Yeah, from there across the stone hills, the the Taj Tepeler. Yeah, the stone. Yeah, stone hills. Um, to the other site, and of course, there's probably. Numerous places on the tops of these hills, like it looks when you look out into the distance, you see these little peaks, yeah, sticking up on these what otherwise should be sort of a flat, almost like a flat horizon because all the tops of the hills are roughly the same elevation, pretty close. And many of them have a little, like, well, it looks a little from dist a distance, but there's a mound or a peak yes, or something on the top, on top, like it's clearly somebody has built something on We've top. We've definitely, of it. we definitely got to walk to some of these where it's obvious there's like a midden pile, yeah. On top of this hill, possibly it was co cobblestone construction. There's that doesn't seem to be cut blocks, but it's just this midden pile up there. And uh, some of the f local farmers have like stacked the blocks up into these little tower, yeah. small towers. Yep, they say for shade because there's just no shade right anywhere. So we, yes, that's right. You stack this thing up, and then you can sit on one side of it and get out. Yeah, of the, the sun. shepherds. Yeah, because yeah. they're out there with the flocks and like you want somewhere to be in the shade so they have and, and where you can see your flock. So 
on top of the hill, they made this little tower and you can sit in the shade there. But they're making it out of the blocks of these mounds. Yeah. <laughs> they're, they're, like there should be no material on top of this hill. Right. It should be erosional. There shouldn't be anything up there except because everywhere else on the hill is just flat rock, yeah. just bare, bare. And yeah. then there's just mound of cobblestones and dirt. Yeah. It's obvious that like, okay, yeah, this is, yeah. I, I had the idea and, and then I got on Google Earth. I was looking all around. And you could just see the dots. Yeah, they're everywhere. They're all over these hills. Yeah. And so I had the idea to kind of we we both came to the same conclusion, I think independently, that this that that a lot of what we saw there reminded us of the Chaco culture. Yes. When we were out in Pagosa Springs. And, and then s- later we went to Chaco Canyon on the Chaco way back Canyon. from S- Scablands. But you know, they made Or Montana. Was that Montana we did that? I can't remember. One of those yeah, trips. Montana, tra- yeah, Montana. Yeah. They, they made um, these signal towers, right? The Chaco culture. Yeah. That's right. Or the Pueblo culture, whichever yeah, one. Pueblo culture. They made these signal towers at the tops of these hills that they, they could communicate with each other for hundreds of miles. So the tower was there, probably filled with logs and stuff. You could light a fire in it quickly. And then you see that fire on the distance, you light yours. Yep. And then they see that one, they light theirs, and so on. Then the whole... You yep. know, the whole one, culture. One bit communication, on or off. Yes. It means like, <laughs> you know, whatever you all decided it meant. Yeah. Time to drink beer. <laughs> I don't know what it meant, but you're right. It's one bit communication. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> hey, maybe you light it and then you then you put it out or whatever. Yeah, you, know, you could. Like, yes. You could add another bit in there. You could, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you Yes, you could develop some kind of rudimentary, <laughs> like, you know, like hang a cloth and then take it away and hang a cloth and so they would see it get dark and light. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> man. But so that was the idea. I was like, man, maybe they were building these signal towers because, you know, like the, they had told us that there's 40 some odd sites, at least these, you know, these tells, these mounds on the tops of these hills that are, that have T pillars that are like Ubekli Tepe. So whoever was doing this, perhaps they were also building signal towers. I don't know. It's just a, just a thought to communicate with each other across yeah. this massive landscape. Yeah. It's, it's, it's weird to us because, well, not weird, but it's interesting to us because, for one thing, we felt somewhat at home in this landscape. Yeah, because sure. these, this terrain at the very at least is very familiar to us. Like it looks like the Texas Hill Country. The difference is, is we have a lot of scrub trees, and you know undergrowth or whatever, and and here it's just it's there's no trees. I mean, there's in a couple Turkey, of valleys yeah. where there's some ter- for th- where there's some trees, um, but for the most part, the hills are just bare. Uh, so it kind of looks the like trees. But, yeah, the trees in the in the valleys are not natural. Yeah, they're definitely farmed. Right. So it was interesting. It was like walking around, like everywhere we went. We, the the limestone looks very familiar to us. The way it erodes everything, we're just like this is like Texas, it's so it's where we where we live in Texas. Except it's just it, like, like if somebody came and erased all the trees, this is what our landscape would look like. Yeah. And here we're used to finding midden mounds down by the water, in the valleys, not at the tops of the hills. There are some. I, I've I've never personally seen one, but I've heard that there some people have found like big mounds at the very tops of hills mm. and stuff. I mean, I've I've been told this. I've never By seen some one guy myself. who knew a dude who had yeah, a cousin yeah, yeah, who yeah, one yeah. time found a midnight. Listen, old boy. <laughs> <laughs> I know some people that are beating around on the rock up there. <laughs> that, okay, <laughs> they've yeah. seen some shit. All right, okay, that's a legit source. <laughs> okay. <laughs> old dozing up in there. Yeah, 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 yeah. If it was, if that came from a dozer, that's <laughs> that's a legit source. <laughs> but yes, I, they're not common. I've never seen one here. But like you're saying, we've we've we're used to seeing these mounds, this, this, I mean, it's not like we see the them place where this artificial hill was in Sogmatar is where you find the yeah, mountain mounds, that right? Should be, it, yeah. On a, like a, it, where the river splits yeah. right in there. And this is a place where the water just completely encircles the island. That's yeah. perfect. 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 Yeah. yeah. And it's great too, because I mean, it, it's, you can see the changes to the landscape because you stand, once you climb up one of the hills and you look down at this, this artificial mound and you can see the river valley and now it's just flat. It's flat and green, but it's clear just looking at the landscape. Oh yes. The water went through here and it was thousands of years ago, right? It's now it's dry. 
It's, now there's there was a same thing near Gobekli Tepe, same thing near Karahan. You can once you get up on top of the hill, you look down and you can see ah, there was the water, but it's way down there compared to where they were doing all this work. But think about when we were at the Devil's River, right? People donated to the show. We left. That's right. The Devil's River was like the first thing we did. Yeah. Like, yeah. You pay us money. We'll <laughs> leave and not record any shows. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> we went to the Devil's River and we were blown away by the, by like we're, we're the in location this, of the, we're yeah. in this cave way up on this hill with this just incredibly steep thing going down and the water is way so down far there. away. Yeah. And it's like, what were they doing up here? Right. Yeah. Like, uh, it's it's basically right off the edge of the cliff. You you go down the cliff. You have to f- wind your way down and find this yeah. way down. And there's just this massive midden pile there. Yeah. And we were making jokes about it. It was shaman school. Yeah. You know, shaman it's like school. you know, like, you send the weird guy. He goes up and lives <laughs> in the cave up on the hill. There was this huge buzzard's nest up there. Yeah. You know, it was like or eagles. Na- eagles I don't know. Nest, it was just yeah. a massive thing of you know. Yeah. Like, man. Yeah. This this was definitely shaman territory. Mm-hmm. Somebody brought him water. Well, and the other thing, yes, the other thing we thought of is like maybe the water was higher or closer to this yeah. site at the time. I mean, we don't but there how were, old. There were know. middens down at yeah, the river down. level that had the same lithics, mm. you know. Yeah, because they were stealing them from the shaman cave. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, yes, I see what you're saying. Yeah. It's, it's, Somebody it's, lived far away from the water and it would be, it's not, you know, to, to get... To lug water up to that site. Oh, my God. Would have been just nightmare. And to any of these sites, Gobekli Tepe, you know. Now, in Karahan, they seem to have built cisterns, right? And there's some respectable holes in, and, in and the Gubekli stone. And Gobekli Tepe as well. Yeah, there's respectable yeah. holes in the stone where, like, it holds water, but not a lot of water. Yeah. But if they had, if they had regular rain... You could probably. It's enough to get like one glass before you go to bed after you drink beer like <laughs> all day. Right. <laughs> That's right. And it's stagnant. You know, it's going to sit there and they have no way of purifying it. So they must have been using it for something. I mean, I don't know. But it, yeah, it, it, you do wonder about the choice of the sites, you know. Now, there are studies that, that the landscape was covered in a sediment like that there was a widespread sediment cover over the whole landscape back in those days uh i just find that difficult to believe for the tops of the hills but okay i mean yeah yeah maybe you're right um but it was apparently wooded as well okay yes there were forests that would do was there was if there was if there was forest respectable undergrowth and and larger grass that could hold the soil against raining Because like you can't you can't both have oh there was a lot more rain and also the hills were covered in dirt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Usually those... no, you have to have a forest. Yeah. Right. To right. hold it. Yeah. And I, I like from what I can tell that's that's kind of what they were they were saying that, that it was wooded that it was that it had a sediment a widespread sediment cover. Yeah. And now all that's gone. And the material that's left the only places where material is left at the tops of these hills is where. They were occupied because the occupation sites have are full of stones. This yeah. is this is my thought. Yeah, that like the because stones are holding the dirt. Yes, basically they were building walls. They were building. They they brought all these stones there. They quarried stones. Whatever they did, they they had built all this stuff. And the walls themselves are acting as like the sort of. Uh, they're holding all that soil in yeah. place. Now it's still eroding because. Obviously, the tops of T-pillars are being exposed. So there must have been a period of uh, deposition, right? There, there had to be some... The, and, and for the tops of these hills, the only thing I can imagine is that it was... It, like there was some wind-blown deposition. Yeah. And the, the wind-blown dusts and stuff are being caught into these enclosures or whatever. Yeah. Obviously, deposition was, most of the deposition was caused by humans bringing stuff there, occupying the site. But in terms of today, it's, it's, it is erosional, but there's so much rock in it that it just, it's, it's at least holding most of that soil in there. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree with that. And that's one of the... the that's why it's so stark when you see 
when you're when you're even on Google Earth, like you can get on Google Earth, go to the Gubec, the site of Gubekli Tepe, and you can see how different it looks than the surrounding hills. And then you, as you start cruising around, you'll see another green patch, or you know maybe it's a yellowish green patch that's at the top of a hill. Yeah, and you're like, there's another one, and another one, yeah. and another one. There's just so many places around those that just seem to have like this spot that's holding soil up high. Yep. Um, but yeah, I don't, I, it is, it is strange why they chose the, the sites that they chose. Like you said, Sagmatar seems to make sense. It's at a, it's on an Island. It was been, would have been surrounded by water. Um, well, at least the Central Hill, there's all those other things all around that are at the tops. Yeah, but still, they're not a far walk. I mean, it's right. not too bad. It's not that. To get down to the to the valley. Right. Or to the creek. But bed. hauling water up there is going to be work every day, all day. It doesn't look like there was... Um, Major occupation yeah, at the any other occupation seven at sites. Those places. Yeah. No, it there's looks like there were... nothing there except right. this temple. Yeah. One thing I would like to see at that place would be, you know... Solstice or equinox, yeah, Some sunrises. Or, yeah, that would be really cool. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I just uh, I agree that the context, the setting in which these places exist, is is very valuable to me to see. Um. We got to cruise the Euphrates. That was fun. Yeah, did. Yeah. <laughs> Jammed out. <laughs> yeah. I snuck a beer. <laughs> ah. <laughs> yeah, there there was a there is an ancient site. There's two sites there that are interesting. One of them is the the flooded like they it's the valley is flooded because of the dam. So there was a little town with a mosque uh that is now underwater and the minaret of the mosque is still sticking out of the water. It's pretty cool. They built a new one up higher, you know, and now the town's kind of climbing the hill. Uh, but it's just beautiful, like, it's a very calm, you know, uh, river valley, and then we just got on this boat, and we cruise down, and we eat lunch, we stop, well, we we order lunch, we get on the boat, we cruise past this ancient castle that's built into the cliff walls, you know, the cliffs are towering above you on either side. While we were there, we could see uh, many, ev lots of evidence of earthquake landslides, slides, like these these huge rock falls mm -hmm. and material falls that where there was like slope failure on the cliffs and all this material fell down into the into the river. So we ordered lunch and then we get on the boat and we go up up river and over to this little town with the uh, the minaret sticking out of the water and we sit and eat coffee and hang out and then we go back and eat lunch and we eat coffee. Sorry, drink coffee. Yeah, I mean, it is Turkish coffee. Yeah, you have to pay, you have to chew it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> drink coffee, uh, hang out and then we go back. So that's a fun day. Um, and the dynamics of that, that landscape is just, yeah, it's, it's incredible. Like you, the descent down to the river is. Oh yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Wow. Uh, a lot of the landscapes that we drove through were just incredibly beautiful. Um, going into the mountainous area and then in, into the valley and then up into the stone hills and down into the Euphrates, it was just all just, you know, you're just looking out the window like, wow. Yeah. <laughs> this is an amazing place. Yeah. Nimrit. Nimrit was really cool. That was the probably the longest drive and also some of the most amazing yeah. landscapes through the drive. Yeah. Like once you get up into the mountains and we're cruising these mountain roads and just looking out and just like, oh my God, this is amazing. Speaking of choices of places to build. Yeah. What? <laughs> <laughs> this is like the, the highest the mountain. The highest mountain <laughs> in the area and, and 360 degrees and you're looking out. It's just the most rugged. Yes. Mountainous. Just like impassable. And, yeah. yeah. Unbelievable, and it's it. You know, I've I've been looking at this site for years. I've yeah, I'm fascinated by it because there's clearly something hidden there that no one has seen since it was hidden, and that's what makes it fascinating. Because it's you know you you know like it's 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 clear. Uh, even the the standard model archaeology story is like yes, there's a tomb under this tumulus 
uh, which is basically this massive artificial mound of gravel. It's on top of this mountain. So when you get up there, there's three uh, pedestals or terraces with the statues that everyone's seen. You know that they kind of there's the the eagle and the the prince and the uh, the lion, right? Uh, and they're they're arranged in lines. One's east, one's west, one's is it the north side? Yeah. So they've got an east, west, and north side pedestal or terrace with these statues and these carvings. The but, south side is completely yeah, bare. Right. Folks. Totally bare. Yeah. But those pedestals are basically fronting the east, west, and north sides of this absolutely massive mound of artificially made gravel material. It's like uh, cobbles, you know, hand size. Yeah, like fist sized cobbles that are very angular. Angular, yes. They're clearly broken up. And for, made for this purpose, they're all very regular in in size. They're made of limestone, but a very silicate rich limestone, like yeah. Tura limestone. They bre- it breaks, it it shatters, it uh, and it, it's visible from miles. Oh yeah, around it, you can see like there's the highest peak, and on top of it is this enormous pile of stuff. It's clear from like everywhere around you in the landscape, you can see this thing. Like you know, we were still fifteen or twenty minutes away by by driving, and way out there, you can see this massive thing sitting on top of the hill. Like that's it up there. That yeah. that's the thing we're going to see. And like what the pile of rock? Yes. And where I mean, the is the source? Are cool, but really, it's that pile of where rock. Where is the source of that rock? Yeah. Where did they? So get when it? we were driving up the mountain side to get to Nimrud, I'm looking at this rock on the road cut. It's part of the bedrock, right? I was like, this is like, I, I recognize this type of stone. Yeah. It has all these flint inclusions mm-hmm. in it, li- in layers. When we were in the Valley of the Kings, when one of the, one of the uh, tombs we were walking down into, you could see the lines of oh, yeah. the layers of flint included in this. And that, yeah. that limestone is that really silica-rich, yeah. tura, very hard, yeah. brittle, Limestone, it, it almost, I mean, you can almost nap it like flint. Right. Basically. It wants to break like glass. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what this mound is made of, and that's what's down in the bedrock underneath this mountain. Yeah. And there is there is a place where it's sort of like, it looks like the, the top of the rock is kind of cut off, so it looks like they actually sheared, sheared off a off. piece of this. Mm. But that, I looked at that material, and I'm like, that's not, not the, right the same. Like, they, it, this is from deeper down. Like, when... Because when we drove up, you park in, a, in an area, and then you walk up this long walkway to actually get up to the mountain. There's no road to get up there. Yeah. And uh, right there at the parking area, there's a huge exposed layer of this material from the road cut. Mm. So it's definitely down there. I don't know how, how high it goes, but, yeah, my thought was that, like, whatever – tunneling they did down into the mountain is the source of this yeah material yeah that was the only thing i could think of too that if there that that maybe there was a mountain peak there and they completely destroyed it and built whatever they were building and then tunneled in and then piled all of the the core the tailings yeah on top of the but yes there's it's almost size sorted and that that may be just from time right yeah that that, that the smaller finds washed away yeah um I don't know, but it it looks there's something under it. It looks size sorted. <laughs> yeah, it's it is. It's the most per, like so. We were discussing this, you know. There's the whole, and I, I think we've gone through this somewhat on the show before. But the the philosophy of doors, like you know, you if you if you're trying to hide something, and you need to put a door, uh, you know, to to close off the area you're trying to hide. You have two cho- basic choices. One is you completely conceal the door, right? So that no one even knows there's a door there. That makes it so that somebody would have to basically find the door by accident to realize there's a door there. Like you completely seal it and you make it so that it's just, there's, it's just not, there's no obvious door. It looks like a wall or a cliff. The other method is to make the door extremely impregnable, right? You can't break through it. It's just like, it's very strong door, but those doors are obvious, 
and obvious doors make people want to get through them, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, like, this is why we, you know, we've talked about the idea of a, the pyramid being a tomb. It's like, this is an extremely obvious tomb entrance. Everyone's going to be <laughs> trying to break into it for thousands and thousands of years. Somebody will eventually succeed. Well, this particular mound at Nimrut is like the best solution I've ever seen to the obvious door that's hard to break into because it's a pile of gravel. (laughs) It's going to take a lot of work to get to whatever's hidden under that gravel because you take, you know, you start digging the gravel out and the gravel above it falls down. Mm -hmm. So you basically have to remove almost all of the gravel (laughs) to get to whatever's hidden underneath it. It's a, it's a resealing door. It's a self, self resealing door. Right. Yeah. You start you start opening the door and yeah. it closes. You again. can't really blow it up. <laughs> I mean, you can if you set off explosives, but guess what? It just reforms <laughs> itself into the door you were trying to explode right after you do it. <laughs> so this is why no no one has dug into it yet. Like, you know, it could be done, but when you read about it, it's basically like they tried a couple of times, but it's dangerous. You're at, at the top of the mountain. There's steep cliffs on most sides of it, you know, and also they're trying to preserve the statues or whatever. So what are you going to, how do you get the equipment up there? You start moving the material. Where are you going to put it? Like, you, and then if you're digging in and then the whole thing starts collapsing, it's going to push you and your equipment off the side of the mountain, <laughs> right? So it's, it is a logistical nightmare. <laughs> and then if that, of course, makes you ask the question, well, how did they build this? pile of gravel on top of this mountain who was doing it what was the strategy how did they how did they make it so tall without having the same problems you know so it's it's interesting but there is something hidden under it you know the the standard story says that there's three chambers they know there's three they've done some scanning some gpr and there's three chambers in there and they think it's the tomb of the king the antiochus whatever his name is uh the guy who made the statues you know, but it, it there are also Hall of Records legends associated with this site. In other words, like another possibility is that what's concealed beneath that mound is much older than the statues. Yeah. And the statues are there because of the mound. Right. That this king, the king is whatever. associating himself with yeah. something much more ancient of the gods. Right. Which is something we see everywhere, everywhere. else. Yeah. Yes. That's that's my preferred story. I love that. <laughs> I love that story too. <laughs> I totally I'm totally willing to I'm buying it. <laughs> yeah. I'm totally willing to accept that it may just be the tomb of this guy, but also it's possible and we just don't know. We it's it's one of these fascinating things where we know there's something in there, but we don't know what it is and whatever it is has not been plundered yeah. since it was put there. Because yeah. the only way it could have been plundered and be in the condition it is in today as if whoever did all the stealing put the gravel back. So yeah, they, we they know that back. didn't happen. Yeah. We know they didn't tunnel into it because you can't. Yeah. The only way they could have plundered it is to remove all the material and it's still there. So no one has gotten into it since that pile of gravel was put there. So we know there's something in there that hasn't been accessed. So it was fascinating for me. I was standing on one side of the mountain just looking up at this pile of gravel and like I'm like, I'm standing extremely close to what could be like one of the halls of records that was preserved for whoever knows how long from the last destruction. Snake Force Unite. Right. Everybody needs to go there and throw a piece <laughs> one of rock off, off the hill. The hill. <laughs> we can do it. They can't stop all of us. <laughs> you Naruto run up there. Storm Nimrut. <laughs> Where's our Storm Area 51 soundbite? <laughs> it's long gone. <laughs> Storm Nimrut. That's it. That is, yeah, that's long gone. <laughs> okay, All right, let's take a break. Break down. we didn't get lost and die on this trip. We're still still trying. It hasn't happened yet. No glad as of yet. Did we get close? Did somebody get close? Did anybody uh, get lost? We lost George. Yeah, we did lose George once. <laughs> the boat left him. He failed to get on the boat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so we've given a brief overview of 
most of the sites we saw. So let's get down into the, some of the details that you want to talk about with uh, with Gobekli Tepe. And the Kyle's been reading archaeological papers. There's an excellent blog called uh, Tepe Telegram. Yeah. Uh, which I read pretty much all of the scientific work on. They've got other stuff there about, oh, what's happening? Or, oh, there's a flood or whatever. But, you know, there's they're discussing papers and everything. So I read all that stuff. It's really fascinating. Um, and some of the details will be in this uh, short video we're going to make. But Kyle has found some great stuff in these papers. Yeah, I just, first of all, my my initial impression of seeing these mounds up on these hills, like like the mound of, of Gubekli Tepe, it's so enormous. There's so much material up there that all had to have been brought uh, by people. It's just immediately to me difficult to believe that this was all intentionally buried. There's an orchard on top of some of it, right? That, yes, there's a massive those trees orchard are up planted there. in it. In the, the trees stuff. are planted. The, they, they were farming it because it was the only place with soil. Up right. There, yeah. Right. And and it it's great for olives. Olives. Um, they like the rocky soil. They they also like they don't like wet feet. Yeah. So you grow them in a valley and they stay wet. It's yeah. not good. Yeah. But up on a hill, they 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 get it, it drenched. Drains. Yeah. Then it drains. Anyway, um, it's so much material. And and when we're walking up, I'm I'm looking at the side of the little sidewalk that they've sort of cut into the into the mound, and you know, there's just like 16 inches or so of just a you know cut right into the dirt and you can see the dirt you can see the layers in there and I'm just like that's midden yeah it's I midden. mean it's straight yeah. up it's clearly midden. it looks just like the midden from from here little fist sized chunks of limestone lots of flint you know all kinds of you know shells bits and pieces of basalt um tools and whatnot and bones I, I saw a lot of bones at at Karahan Tepe so, so both of these sites are similar, right? Karahan doesn't have all of the the uh, infrastructure built around it, so you get to walk up there, and it's just looking at the massive size of this yeah. hill. And you get up there, and you get to the top, and you look down, and you just see these other mounds with the T-pillars sticking out. It's just incredible. It's, yeah. it's, it's so enormous that, to me, like if this, if this was here... I, I I would see it as a just a, a midden mound that they build up. I mean, we've we've walked on midden mounds like the one in Devil's River. Yeah. Best example. It's at least twenty five feet deep. Yep. It's huge. It's 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 a hundred yards long or more. This massive mound just on the side of this cliff, and it's just pouring down the side of the cliff. You can see it from a mile away. Yeah. The whole surface of the ground looks different from from this material. This material was brought there over many thousands of years. It built up because people were constantly bringing stones there. They're doing whatever the work they're doing, and you know, there's a lot of theories about how, why the, the why they brought the stones uh, for for here. You know, there, there were cook fires and stuff, and they'd build these brick sort of fire rings and and whatnot. Uh, there is some talk about that in the literature that there was like a fire. You know they're they're cooking. They're doing a lot of cooking. Um, they they killed a lot of game. They brought all this game to the site. They were cooking it and feasting and all this kind of stuff. It makes a lot of a lot of midden materials. So initially, I'm just like this. First of all, it's just out of this world to me to imagine that some people came there. And erected all these megaliths all over the side of or the top of this hill, carved all this stuff into them, and then brought all this material to fill that up twenty meters deep. Yeah, that's just outrageous, right? It's it's one thing to say that this circle that you all have probably seen when you look at pictures of Gebekli Tepe was filled in, like that the enclosure itself with the T-pillars was like filled up on purpose. Yeah. That's one thing. Where did they get the material to fill that circular enclosure? Hmm. Well, obviously they got it from the already existing midden material. Yeah. Which is what it says in the literature when they're looking at it. They're like, they, they're, they're basically thinking like 
there is some evidence that these these things were already like they that they had to excavate through midden to build the structures in the first place. And so they're saying we're not sure if the midden is older or younger or whatever, but it's like they're taking piles of this midden that they maybe have excavated for one in cir- circular enclosure and throwing it into another one. Yeah. It doesn't tell you how the first one was made. That's sort of just like they dug down, they built an enclosure, and in the digging down, they threw that material into the enclosure they used before and filled that one up. There's all these different ideas that they have going, but to me, it's 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 almost ridiculous to to imagine that they that they built all of these structures and buried them all. And that's sort of the idea that you get when you just look at what the normal narrative is. It's like, okay, they built this huge area and they intentionally buried all of it. Yeah. It's definitely not that. That is completely wrong. So whatever it is, maybe some weird combination of things, like maybe they, maybe some people came along and they were partying and they were, they were feasting and they were, they were intentionally throwing all this material of their feasts and everything. Maybe they were excavating and they were throwing that material into a different area on top of the hill that happened to be an enclosure and they buried some of it, but they definitely didn't bury the entire thing in one. It wasn't like a group of all these hunter gatherers that all decided like, let's bury this entire sacred site. They're not saying that. Maybe somebody is, but that is not what is being said in the literature. Uh, there's even, it looks like the burial was done in phases and the phases span hundreds and hundreds of years. So it's like, to me, I'm like, well, this is occupation. This is, maybe it's anomalous and maybe they were excavating other things, but like to to try to sell this as like they decided as a people that they were going to build these sites and then bury them when they got done with them it's just kind of isn't there a span of like a thousand years between the almost. layers yeah so oh well okay the layers yeah there's three I mean, layers yeah that there's but those span the entire time frame from you know yeah that there's there's gaps right that they can't account for there's like you know the the they have this this era that basically has that they've associated from other archaeological dig sites around where they're like well this is the you know the pre-pottery neolithic b late period and there's yeah. the type of lithics or whatever it's just like not present at Quebec Tepe so it's yeah. like the, those people never occupied the site they were never there yeah um so yeah, it's just that there's there's definitely a lot more to this story than just there was a people that decided to make giant T pillars, carve them with all these intricate things, and then bury the site because it was like, you know, the idea you get that like they they'd come out of the younger Dryas this this this, this destruction, and they built this site to commemorate the the past era that is now gone, and then they buried it. Right. Definitely not. What no. happened? No. In some cases, there's evidence that like some of the pillars were like half buried for a thousand years or more yeah. before they were completely buried. Um, and and Which every just, and, I mean that just seems like occupation. That's what I'm. That's what I keep saying. But yeah. but now there definitely was excavating going on. That's what because because normal occupation would provide these layers that have a stratigraphy that as you date samples as you go down it gets older yeah and that is all jumbled up so it does look like people were excavating and throwing materials in one place or another and yeah, to me well, i've kind of had this idea that it's like this looks like ancient archaeology to yeah me. that's what i'm saying like let's say that you're living in this in the spot and you're living there because there's these convenient pillars that are helping you hold up your tents or whatever it is that you're using you know you've built some walls you know, some cobble walls around them or whatever, and you've got, and then you're, but you're noticing that the pillars are, are partially buried. So you're like, well, I want to see kind of what's at the bottom of these things. Yeah. So you dig it out and you throw it into the other c- enclosure. Yeah. Just to see the, and you're like, you, you're like, wow, this is, these are actually four feet taller than I thought. 
right? Because you dig down to the bottom of the material. Now you want to see what's the, at the bottom of the rest of them. So you <laughs> go to the next circle and you start digging that stuff out and throw it back into the hole yeah. that you dug the original stuff yeah. from. And I mean, but this is not the same people. No, right? that's what like, I'm saying. Because, yeah, it's not the same people. Because it's, one enclosure may have dates of one, you know, like a certain time period. Yeah. The next enclosure gives like slightly different ones yeah. by maybe a couple hundred years or yeah. something. Yeah. So it looks like that they did sort of go from one to a, to the other. Yeah. And and to me, it's hard to say like this was those people mm -hmm. because when you talk about hundreds of years passing, I mean, like, are we the same people as the Americans two hundred years ago? Like, in a way, yeah. But we have vastly different ideas and yeah. a different way of life. It's it's uh that I kind of have trouble with that because you know if you imagine like a portion and of and we're it, doing archaeology on their stuff. Exactly. Yeah. A couple of hundred years is plenty of time for you. There are, there are Civil War archaeologists. Yeah. <laughs> who are digging up the battlefields and finding artifacts. I'm really, I really <laughs> like this idea of ancient archaeology, and I'll, I'll, I'll lay it out. At the very, very bottom of, like, when, you ex when they excavated down to the very bottom, they get to the bedrock of an, of an enclosure, and the bedrock is cut. I mean, the, the, the people who built the these stone enclosures they flattened the bedrock yeah god they carved it flat they left raised uh pedestals in the center for the central pillars to stand in they're socketed in um and in general and i'll just throw this in in general this was my impression walking around the site a couple we went several times and it was just reinforced the second time we were there um that the actual creation of the platforms which are, like Kyle said, rock cut with the pedestals. And then the central T-pillars of each one seemed there. it's better work than all the surrounding T-pillars in general. In some cases, you see one that it's like an outlier. Like the, the pillar that has the beautiful cat sculpture on it is not one of the central T-pillars of an enclosure. Right, but, you know, like Yusuf says, this, this could, those differences could just be the difference from one artist to the other. Yeah. Right? Like, I, I I, kind of agree with that. Like, I don't... Like, what I think what you're saying is they they spent more time, they were more careful with these central pillars. Yeah. Not that they were different cultures, perhaps. But they even the... the well, yeah, I don't, they don't have to be different cultures, but the pillars around the outside, they look more pitted. They're, like, less refined, mm -hmm. you know... Yeah, they weren't they weren't polished smooth yeah. like the central ones. So maybe you're right. Maybe they just didn't spend as much time on them. But like the central ones and the platforms that they're on, like stood out to me as the best work. Yeah, especially the busted ones. Like I wish those were oh, intact. God, because those... that's, okay, that's another really interesting yeah. thing. I want I want to lay this out though real quick. Yeah, at the very bottom, they found certain types of arrowheads and projectile points. Those types are known types from many other archaeological sites all through the Levant, and, and uh, they had been established as an era. Yeah. PPNA. PPNA, the Pre-Pottery Neolithic A. Yeah. There is another set of the same type of, you know, arrowheads and lithics and whatnot that are as a different era, PPNB, which is, which is a little bit later. Those are the two deepest layers. At, at Gubekli Tepe, and they're, they basically were able to date them at 12,000 years just based on those lithics. Yeah. Then they did all this work on the carbon dating. Eventually, they, they kind of get some solid dates from the, from the mortar or the plaster from the rock walls yeah. that matches. The and it DNA. was at the very bottom yeah. of the plaster of a rock wall, down at the bedrock level. Yeah. So they do have these corroborating dates, but none of it really dates the the megaliths yeah. or the the time of construction now they could have built these rock walls to me these rock walls look like restoration projects yep this is why i like the ancient arch, uh, uh, archaeologist idea that they that they had found these sites that they partially they, sticking out of the hill they excavated them yeah. they built these rock walls to support the pillars that couldn't stand on their own yep and the idea of reburying an archaeological dig is a well-known practice in archaeology, as yeah. our buddy Kevin, who was on one of the tours, had, had pointed out. Yeah. Like, they'll they'll do this massive dig. They lay plastic at the bottom of the dig, 
Then they just throw all the material back in. Yeah. When they leave, and then they come back the next season, they excavate it again. Yeah. And continue digging where they were. Yeah. So in that respect, that would be really freaking cool if that if if it turns out that this was that this was actually an excavation project purposefully excavated. There was a team there, the feasting and all the kind of other stuff that's sort of, you well, know, what would they about. be doing it for? Like, what is their archaeology to, to, to learn something about their ancestors? I don't know. It's uh, why are we doing it? It's fascinating. Well, they can't date anything. They can't like, what are they? I can't date anything. I'm <laughs> digging. <laughs> <laughs> I'm digging. Oh, boy. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna find those artifacts. <laughs> Yeah, it's, uh, it's it's treasure hunting. So yeah, to get it, getting to the to the this this enclosure you were talking about where the, the central T pillars was destroyed. There's there's they found evidence that a giant pit was excavated in the center of that enclosure directly to the two central pillars, and they were shattered. Yeah, and the pieces of those pillars were just left all scattered around in the pit, and then I guess the pit was refilled. Yeah, and they called it an iconoclastic. Action. So it was. It's a, a purposeful destruction of symbols from the past or whatever. Yeah. Uh, similar to you know, Russ Russ called it redacted, right? It's like yeah, a, it's redacted. All these faces and stuff on the Egyptian temples that have been their noses are knocked off and their faces are just scratched out. That's that's They're iconoclasm. Erasing, yeah, it's iconoclasm. Yeah. Which is a great word, a great term. I had to look up. But I love that term. That's, uh, but anyway, uh, I found that fascinating. They, they eventually dated that to, um, roughly like 4,000 years after the site was abandoned. Yeah. So it's, it's like 6,000 BC. Yeah. I just wonder like, um, or 6,000 years ago, 4,000 BC. Yeah. Like 6,000 years ago or something yeah. like that. Um, or what is this? Is it the sixth millennium beast? The sixth millennium is what they say. So that's like five. Sixth millennium BC. I can't, I can't remember. <laughs> Anyways, I get confused by those. I hate the way they talk. <laughs> the about late, me. early sixth millennium BC. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I found this fascinating because it, 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 it tells you it's like this little glimpse that like somebody at some point in the middle of this massive time span between us and, and, and the creators of this site knew something about it. Yeah. Went there, dug directly to these pillars that were buried, destroyed them and then reburied it. And we had, we had had this great conversation about it. That's like, you know, uh, there's, there's all these ideas about, I mean, the patriarchs are from this place. Yeah. Uh, there was the, the whole thing about, um, Oh, Noah's son. Noah's son going yeah. and looking for the pillars finds of the, yeah. Enoch and whatnot. Yeah. Finds the pillars with the writings of the ancients from before the flood, learns their secrets, and then he's afraid to tell his father. Come on, dude. Yeah. <laughs> that is cool. <laughs> and I was thinking, like, did, you know, the, the people that did this, what were their legends? Yeah. Did they have legends what at the time stories? that yeah. there was, like, a secret hidden up in the hills? Yeah. From the ancient past? Yeah. I just find, like, something powerful yeah. hidden in the hills, right? There's this there's magical, powerful, yeah. whatever, this knowledge or something hidden up there, buried, yeah. lost in time. Dude. Yeah. I just, I, I mean, it. yes, I, I did think, it occurred to me that... Like, I love the idea of archaeology, that they're trying to relearn the language. And like like you're saying, you do see this in this this particular, this story about Noah's son, about how they, they were basically forbidden to learn this ancient knowledge because it's the reason the world was destroyed. Right. Yes. And he goes and learns it anyway. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, that's really cool. And that is a form of archaeology. Right. You know, and I know we always rail on the whole like looted in antiquity. Oh, it was treasure hunters, but it could also be that like if the tops of these pillars are sticking out, somebody was like, "There's treasure there," and yeah, they're gonna they, dig it out, yeah. and they're gonna be like, "No treasure in this one. Let's dig out the next one and throw all the fucking dirt in this first hole." Yeah, and maybe, and maybe 
like they hit it inside the pillar somehow or whatever they didn't know yeah that's, i don't know yeah yeah like, like people people have been known to you know those the the spheres from costa rica or whatever mm. the giant stone yeah 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 they blow them up looking for treasure inside them <laughs> that's what the story is anyway <laughs> Right? Jeez. So, like, if you have myths that the ancients uh, could manipulate God. stone, and you're like, wow, they're clearly it's, hidden. See, it's the geopolymer people. <laughs> That's right. It's the geopolymer people responsible for this. <laughs> if you didn't believe in geopolymers, you wouldn't think that there was treasure <laughs> hidden inside a solid stone. <laughs> Golly. <laughs> Uh, right, it's the I, geopolymer people. Yeah, if you just believe in the magic of the ancients, that they could. <laughs> Form stone around whatever. So, like, clearly the T-pillar has treasure inside it. Somebody so. in the snake force can tell me if I ever was a geopolymer person, but I don't think I was. <laughs> <laughs> so the, some of those people have listened to the you entire show. You may be responsible for the destruction of ancient ar- ancient stone artifacts. I don't think I ever was a geopolymer person. <laughs> Maybe for, like, one minute when I saw nubs, <laughs> I was like, they injected molding, whatever, but no. Anyways. <laughs> <laughs> Injected molding. <laughs> Injection molding. <laughs> <laughs> there was possibly, 30 seconds. There was possibly a nub at Gobekli Tepe on the back of one of those pillars. Maybe it for, was maybe tough for to five see. minutes. Though. Maybe for five minutes he was a geopolymer guy. Maybe for a whole day. I was Could a, have been an entire it day. It was a week. <laughs> God. It took me about a year <laughs> to get I, I I I was busy. <laughs> I was doing other things. I what I only thought about it for about a week, but it took a year for that week to take place. <laughs> and then after that, I was no longer He a, actually geopolymer. just stopped being geopolymer <laughs> guy when we went to Turkey. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm still a geopolymer person. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> You're responsible. <laughs> but yes, there was a nub, I think. It's hard to tell, but the back of one of those uh, outside pillars looked like it had a a nub sticking out of the side of it. Really? I, I, I thought it... I took multiple photos of it. It was just difficult to see it. Mm. But it could have been a sculpture. High relief carving yeah. or something, yeah. That, that was one, one cool thing, too, about... Like at, at Carahan, for example, you got to walk up and, and touch these... Artifacts, these stones, these pillars and whatnot laying around. And that one has a giant rock cut enclosure. Oh, yeah. Where, where, the, I, where the external T pillars are basically part of the bedrock. It was yes. amazing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, the the carvings, the high relief carvings are there, just barely visible. This, yeah. is, this is another reason why I think the, the cover is good. Because you can see that like these exposed stones, like they, they must have been in, exposed for some time in antiquity. Yeah. The carvings, you can barely see this, like, you know, animal carving on there, but it's just so worn down. The pillar had been laying down for some time, probably. Yeah. The carving was faced up. And there was there were interesting size problems that, you know, like going to Egypt and you stand in front of the pyramids or one of the temples and you just, the, and the, the, the size of it just, like, hits you. Like, you just can't, it, it can't be conveyed in photographs. At Karahan, it was interesting because... The like iconic or famous thing of Karahan is that uh, the sort of rock cut hole with all the the pillars that are part of the stone with the head sticking out. That was way smaller than I thought because yeah. of, like I've seen all these photos and you just you know in the photo I've, I but no this thing was was pretty small. Yeah, you know if you were standing down in there you would be taller than the pillars and they yeah. and but they had heads st- sitting on yes top they, of them, they, right? they yes they we carved were told heads that they used to have carved heads and those are now in the museum which we didn't right. get to see but. The other thing at Karahan that was way bigger than I expected was the rock cut circular enclosure with the benches. Oh, it was huge. Yeah, it was massive. So it was weird because this like this cistern thing with the pillars sticking up, with the head sticking out, was like tiny. But then, the, and I thought that was big. And then the the rock cut enclosure with the benches was massive. And then the pillars that were in there, there used to be pillars, freestanding pillars, are now these just crumbled shattered fragmented things but they were gigantic enormous enormous they're just laying on the floor in there and the, they've kind of put them together where the you can see all the pieces are going together like a puzzle but so the pillar is you know all there and they they would have been massive like yeah. absolutely gigantic this is another thing about 
these rock walls that I, I want to talk about. These these cobblestone walls. The rocks in these walls are not hewn. They're not cut square. They're just broken rocks. Yeah, stacked up. Right. The people that 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 made the rock cut enclosure at Carahan were capable of literally carving the bedrock out in ma- in a massive scale. Yeah. One whole side of the main enclosure at Carahan is rock cut. It has yeah. a rock cut bench. Along the bench are these basically pillars sticking out of the rock. They are part of the bedrock. Yeah. But they 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 are like flat, squarish, flat, tall things that have animals carved into the sides. So these people were capable of literally just Let's make the enclosure out of the mountain. Right. And yet, it is assumed that the people who built these cobblestone walls out of just not even cut stones. Yeah, just stones that they of stones gathered from around. The, yeah. Pebbles stuck in there and everything. And then they, they had sort of mortared it together and then they plaster it. I'm just like, No. And one of those walls has what looks like a fragment of a T pillar stuck in it. So and like this is you yes. were pointing out that this is evidence of reuse. Yeah, they're reuse the people who built these cobblestone walls were reusing old pieces of actually hewn and carved bedrock stones that were made from from the people that I think were actually yeah. you know doing the megalithic work. Yeah. It looks like two stages of construction. Um and and, and whether, possibly for very different uses. It's yeah, like maybe somebody built this for a particular reason, and then later people were living there and turned it there. into round homes and a ceremonial site yeah. and all this stuff. And they were feasting and doing all this crap. Yeah, this is all within the dating in all in all the various ways that the that the archaeologists have dated the site. They all they keep coming up with these similar numbers. Yeah, uh, this is all, in my opinion, the later people. Yeah, that were reusing or rebuilding or restoring, or yeah. worshiping at the site or whatever they were doing there. But there's there's zero evidence that the people that were that were making the arrowheads, the people that were feasting, the people that were building these cobblestone walls were the carvers of the bedrock, and and the carvers of the high relief yeah. imagery. And this is another thing you pointed out, and I totally agree. These arrowheads that are associated, like at least with PPNA, they're cool, but they just or the flint work, not arrowheads. The flint work is it's it's interesting looking, and some of it is quite beautiful, but it isn't as advanced no. as the stuff that we see over here in the from Americas the from the period. same time period. The stuff we have from that same time period is amazing work yeah. here. It's it's artistic. It's beautiful. It's it's they spent time. They have yeah. they have a whole. Uh, methodology. Well, I mean, I can't say that the, these It's just don't. weird to associate these, what would be considered here, more primitive flint work with this amazing rock cut and megalithic yeah. stones. You know, but that is the story. Like, that they, they basically say they made these megaliths and all this rock cut stuff with flint chisels. So we're, yeah. we're not even, we're not even like copper chisels at this point. We're no. like, they're, no, they're using flint. Yeah. And you know, flint is hard and it will cut limestone. But yeah. can you do this level of work? I don't know. I mean, the, maybe. Maybe it is possible. But The other thing I think is that, uh, you know, it's this pre-established, these pre-established eras, the PPNA, the PPNB, um, and the lithics involved and all that, that, that these people that were making these arrowheads were hunter-gatherers. Yeah. They were hunter-gatherers. So they find all of these artifacts there at the lowest levels in Gebekli Tepe, and they're like, well, the people that build it are hunter-gatherers because they've already established from many other sites that the people making those lithics were hunter-gatherers. And how far back does PPNA go? 15,000 years? I don't think so. Okay, it's 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 a small uh, time period. I can look it up. Uh, Well, look it up in the break because we're up at a break anyway. All right. Yeah. Well, we'll take it. So you got you got any finishing thoughts before we go and we tackle I, the whole space just, with the news and emails and all that stuff? I just think number one, this narrative, it's it it cannot be fully accurate. This and and I don't think that the archaeologists would dispute that. 
I think that yeah, the, the narrative like that it, of it, yeah, yeah the, the archaeologists are are literally talking about the questions that they have about this. Now they have accepted some things like, you know, clearly this site was intentionally buried. But there's nuance to that statement, and they talk about it in the paper, in the papers. Yeah. Uh, however, the mainstream story we've been told, there isn't very much nuance to it. So I just urge and you. That's to, probably just the net nature of science communication. That's what I'm like saying. The nuance it's, is lost in the in the writing yeah. of the article for, yeah. for the general public. People definitely threw a lot of material into enclosures. Was the goal to fill the enclosure with material to cover all of the stones? <laughs> that is never actually said. Yeah. They do say that maybe the, the enclosure, they reached the end of its, what they say, use lives of the enclosure. Like they worshiped there. They did all their stuff there. And then they were like, okay, that one's done. We're going to make a new one. It's done because it's full of trash. <laughs> they excavate for a new one and throw the material in there. Okay. But it's so, like, it's like, yeah. So there's, so it can't be done because it's full of trash. They have, <laughs> they have these ideas yeah. that they don't know that that's actually what was happening. These are, there's, there's are a lot of theories that they're throwing out there, but they, they do say there, there was, in other words, like they were literally throwing a lot of material inside these enclosures. And that seems to be pretty solid. Yeah. But it didn't bury it all the way to the top. It wasn't like this was a goal to like, let's fill the thing completely to the top cover and completely it. Yeah. cover it. Like it's been sort of put out there yeah. that like, oh, they they carved all the imagery. They like were making a sort of a... You know, it's like a time capsule. Yeah, and then they're just going to bury it to preserve, like yeah. leave it for future. No, that that is definitely not what's going on. And there, the other thing is, right next to the main area of Gobekli Tepe is a an empty platform, uh, which I found very interesting. And they're saying, oh, oh yeah, this was the test, right? This is the story. It's like this was the <laughs> yes. test site, and they didn't do it right, of and course. so then they went over to this other place and built more. You know, but I, I have like, I don't know, just walking around in these sites, you have random ideas and I'm just like, this was the marker. Hold on. Let's describe this a little bit better. Okay. Where, where there is no, or very little midden. Yeah. The bedrock is exposed as you're approaching the actual midden of Gubekli Tepe. There's exposed bedrock everywhere. And in this one place. The bedrock is is exposed now. That it, it it did have a shallow cover over it of mm -hmm. midden that they that they dug out, but it's this basically what would be the bedrock portion of the circular enclosure, with the little bench on the side, and the two raised pedestals in the center. Yeah, where the two central pillars would stand, and that's yeah. all there that's is. That's All it they, is. They never found any pillars there. Yeah, it was barren. Yeah. Other than just having some occupation layers on top, not much. Yeah. So, yeah, continue. So, to me, it just, uh, and it's kind of set away from the rest of the site. Now, obviously, I don't know the context of the entire site, because like we were saying, like most of it is still underground. So, maybe you would have a better idea if you could see like an overhead view of like where all the sites are and what it all would have looked like. But this one sort of looked set aside and would be more visible from elsewhere because the, the, the edge of the hill kind of blocks you from seeing most of Gebekli Tepe until you almost get up there. But this one would be visible from way down the hill if there were pillars standing on it, right? So it's a marker that would be visible from much farther away than the rest of the site, which is kind of, which was, would be kind of be hidden above, like if you're down at the, in the valleys, the, uh, the top edge of the hill would hide the site from you, but this one would, would be clear because yeah. it's on the edge. Speaking of iconoclasm. I mean, that could have been destroyed. Yeah. Easily. It's, any, it's like whatever was there is gone. Now, their, their, their story is like, oh, they were this was a test, and they're like making the enclosure, and they didn't do it right. But I think another possibility is that this, this was the visible marker for the rest for, for, that you could see from miles and miles yeah, around. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, and it's just, it's just gone now. Uh, but that, to me, and, this, and the reason I'm bringing that up and the possibility that it was a marker is because I'm going along with what you're saying, like the ad idea that this was intentionally buried. You know, no, this was if that if this was a marker there and it wasn't buried, this is like they're making it clear. You know, there's something here. Mm. So I mean, I guess you might leave that even if you were burying the site. 
because you want a way to find it again later after the landscape has changed drastically if there's been some kind of massive climate shift. Yeah. You know, there's always a marker of some kind, you know. You got to have the pirate map. You got to have the treasure map somewhere. At the very top layers of the of the midden, of the tell, are like artifacts from the Middle Ages and all yeah. that. I mean, these these sites have been yeah, that's literally later. occupied for right. <laughs> 12,000 years yeah. with some gaps. Old farming tools, yeah. <laughs> with some gaps <laughs> right. in there. Yeah. Which is just normal. Like, a, you know, situation changes, people move. They, they leave. Yeah. And come, like, the climate the changes river, or whatever. The river comes back and they, they come they back. They come back. Yeah. And then they go to that spot. Yeah. Like, it's... Because there's a couple of tea pillars standing out yeah. on the freaking hill. And there's probably legends that, yeah. like, this was the fucking realm of the gods or whatever. Yeah. I don't know. Right. The place where the gods came down. That was the it's other thing it's I thought. just absolutely fascinating, yeah. People, I just can't tell you how. And we haven't even gotten into the imagery on the T pillars, so no. we'll have to talk about that on a future episode. We need to take a break. Yeah. All right. We got 15 minutes. No, we have 30 minutes. <laughs> back ladies and gentlemen for the final segment of the final hour of brothers of the servant podcast 30 minutes <laughs> uh we went long 15 minutes <laughs> russ asked for closing thoughts and i have not closed my thoughts yet so uh, yeah well you can keep going <laughs> We got 15 minutes. I mean, we, we got to tackle some space weather news. We got to give them some updates, but we don't have to yeah. read any emails. I got to do some. We've got producer donations we got producers. and stuff. Um, no, I feel like I've said my piece. We're, we'll do more shows on this. this All is, right, well. We're, space weather news. Shut up, Kyle. Lost my job. <laughs> From spaceweather.com, it's been a while since we looked in on what is happening in space. What the hell is going what on What weather is there. going on in space. I know there was a major geomagnetic storm at the end of April. I think it was while we were in Turkey. Uh, but right now it's calmed down. So, but we, but spaceweather.com says there is another CME coming. But this one will not cause a severe geomagnetic storm. Unlike the CME that struck Earth directly on March 23rd, the next CME will deliver only a glancing blow. It was hurled into space on April 24th by an explosion in the sun's southern hemisphere. Most of the CME will sail harmlessly south of our planet. Minor G1 class geomagnetic storms are possible on April 27th when the CME arrives. And in the Earth's southern hemisphere, the severe geomagnetic storm of April 23rd and 24th sparked bright auroras and Steve's. There were Steve's photographed. Uh, they were beautiful. Steve's are strong thermal emission velocity enhancements. They look like an aurora, but they are not. Again, they are caused by hot ribbons of gas flowing through the Earth's magnetosphere at speeds exceeding 6 kilometers per second, or 13,000 miles per hour. These ribbons appear during strong geomagnetic storms, revealing themselves by a soft purple glow. Steve's are a recent discovery. Skywatchers in Canada identified it less than 10 years ago. Since then, they have been seen many times in the Northern Hemisphere, but not as often in the South. So the sightings on April 23rd and, t and through the 34th. Wait, I don't know, is there an April 34th? I don't think so. <laughs> uh, but they are the, among the best so far of austral Steve's from the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, and then how far, how low did the northern lights go? A CME hit Earth's magnetic field on the 23rd of April, a direct hit that sparked a severe G4-class geomagnetic storm, and the northern lights spilled out of the Arctic Circle all the way down to the U.S.-Mexico border. Dang. That's pretty low. Yeah. I wonder if we, uh, how do we miss these auroras? We could have seen them. Hmm. Yeah. Solar wind speed, current conditions, solar wind speed, 528.6 kilometers per second. The density is 10 protons per cubic centimeter. Sunspot number right now is 87. Uh, neutron count is 2.6% below the space age average. So minus 2.6%. Uh, 
Uh, and let's see, the KP index is 2.67, which is quiet, and the 24-hour max is 3.33, which oh, is man. still in the quiet range. But yes, it was very high uh, recently, up in the 6 and 7, I think. Maybe higher. So that is your Space Weather News for the week. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Also want to mention a Snake Wife's birthday is coming up on the oh, 29th, 29th, Saturday. It's close. Are we doing anything? Is she uh, going to get drunk? Yeah, probably. Should we bake her a cake? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Do we have plans? <laughs> uh, yeah, we got plans. Okay. They're secret. Mm. Secret plans. Just wanted to let uh, the Snake Force know. Yeah. You know. Um, yeah, let's see. I don't have any news stories. I don't care about what's going on in the news. <laughs> Ag update. I'm uh, back to labeling bottles. We're <laughs> working on the hillside. Everything is beautiful up yes. there. We've got hail all around us. We haven't been nailed yet. All the vines are covered in nets. Mm -hmm. Everything's protected. We're fruit thinning. We're shoot uh, training. training. Um, it's muddy. Bees look good. Yeah. Yep. Sounds good. <laughs> God dang. God dang. Farm life. Okay, I got producers. I right. would like to get to this pronto. Producers, you, and we got the, the one up. Severe box. limitations on our yeah, yeah, yeah. on our last segment here. <laughs> <laughs> um. So, first. I would like to mention Jim Kugler. Ah, yes. Jim. We've met him on uh, numerous trips, and he actually, when I was in Asheville, he was there. He gave me 100 bucks for the show. So I was supposed to give him an executive producership for the show we did before we left, and I forgot. But you know what? You get an executive producership for the Gebekli Tepe show. Yeah. So that's, that's even better. Thank you so much, buddy. Really appreciate it. Hope to see you on future trips, and I know I'll see you in Asheville at the Cosmic Summit. Uh, next executive producer is Andrea Johnson, and she says, I wanted to buy the $50 Dynasty album to support, but Jesus, it's available on Spotify. Feels like theft, and that broke my heart. <laughs> Loving the album. Cheers. <laughs> Thank you, Andrea. Uh, it's Value for Value album. So you did the right thing, except you gave it to you gave it to Russ. Yeah, <laughs> you gave it to Snake Bros instead of the <laughs> to of Russ. The no, I'm just joking. Uh, but it's only theft if you don't pay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we we. It's, I mean, the album is available for free on yeah, the website, and it's you free can even, for the taking. You can download the uh, high res files uh, as well. Burn them on a CD. Burn a bunch of CDs. Pass yeah. them out to your friends who have CD players. <laughs> it's totally uh, totally legit. Uh, so thank you very much for this donation. And you are executive producer of this executive show Executive well. producer. Thank you. Um, let's see. Next is, well, PayPal says it's Anton Carl, but I'm pretty sure it's Carl Anton. Mm. Uh, from Switzerland. Thank you so much, buddy. hundred bucks. Hey, uh, thank you. Met you on the turkey trip. Really yeah. appreciate it. And uh, also no, executive no, producer. Yes, executive producer. No note. And the last executive producer is Edward Joy. Last name spelled G O Y, and I I'm just assuming it's not a um, a slur for non Jews. <laughs> I, that's why I say Joy instead of Goy. <laughs> he says. Uh, have a good time and stay safe in Turkey. We did. We had a great time. Yeah. We uh, stayed safe. Stayed mostly safe. <laughs> stay safe. <laughs> Thank you, buddy, so much. Hunter Bucks, executive producer of this show as well. Then we have uh, for associate executive producers, we've got Roshan. And I'm not sure how to pronounce your last name, bro. Uh, I'm going to assume the X is sh. So it's Roshan. Choshi, perhaps, mm. 50 bucks. We uh, also met him on the Egypt trip. Thank you very much for that donation. And Egypt it was, or Turkey? Oh, I said Egypt. It was a Turkey trip. Okay. 
yeah, great time hanging out, bro. Really appreciate it. Um, oh, wait. Yeah, no, that, that, that's the note. Okay. Next one is Adam Knudsen. Uh, not quite 50 bucks, but I just, I'm going ahead and just push you right in there. Yeah. We're throwing in the extra couple of bucks. Uh, executive uh, associate executive producer of this show. Thank you very much. Thank and you. then um, the last one is Donna Snedden. $50. Donna. Associate executive producer. Thank you, guys. Of this, the 283rd Snake Bros show. Thank you all so much. We yeah. really appreciate it. See, it pays to leave town. Yeah. And not do any shows. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they'll come back. <laughs> <laughs> it's like that, that commercial we made for the pyramid scheme literally says if you pay us money, we'll go to pyramids and we will not be producing any right. shows. Right. Yeah. If you're tired <laughs> of having a new Snake Bros episode in your feed every week, you can make it stop by sending us money and we'll go look at something and not make a show. Yeah. <laughs> it's amazing how it works. You guys are so wonderful. Thank yes. you very much. Thank you. And uh, here, bro. This is a uh, one-up box. There we go. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Old goat trucker hat. <laughs> uh, once again, I, we were drinking the beers. I He sent us six of them. I don't want to drink them all on one show. Yeah. Got to spread it out. Got to spread it out. Yeah. Uh, from. Uh, I can spread one beer out for an entire episode. Kyle drinks five. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> you know, folks, come on. <clears throat> yeah, so this is from Sir Andy and Dame Kylie. Dear Russ and Kyle, hearing the note from Chris saying the Egypt trip was a trip of a lifetime prompted me to start thinking about sending you old boys some beer. We ventured into secret places that I was sure tourists had no right to be <laughs> and cruised the Nile in style. Yeah. Uh, our tour guides, Yusuf Awan, Ben Van Kirkwick, and Marvelous Mo, made sure every desire was met. We got to hang out with Marty Garza, Darren Grimes, and Graham Dunlop, and we had a, a constant stream of comedy in the back of the bus, courtesy of Chris and Brian. <laughs> it was right. Uh, Chris was right. It really was the trip of a lifetime. <clears throat> when by chance last week I scored a pair of Wait, these... you talking about Wanker and Irish? Yes, he yeah, was. Okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he says, uh, Brian. <laughs> when by chance last week I scored a pair of the very rare and highly sought after goat beer hats, hey. I took it as a sign and knew it was time to send a care package to Texas from down under. Thank you both for everything you do. Yours in value for value, Sir Andy and Dame Kylie. Snakes! Ah, thank you guys so much. <laughs> Warm and fuzzies. Warm and fuzzies Beneath from the, the snake scales. pit. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Hmm. Warm and fuzzies from the snakes. Yeah. yeah. It's it's weird. Having Snakes are not supposed to have well, fuzzies. sometimes you swallow entire fuzzies. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> sometimes, the, yes. Warm and fuzzies. <laughs> <Ugh>. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> the best meal for a snake is a warm and fuzzy. <laughs> <laughs> or an egg. <laughs> right. Eggs, That's true. Eggs egg. also work. Yeah. Soon to be warm and fuzzy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's lead, read a Thank couple of all. short emails to, to finish up the show here. We got some short ones. I want to hear the comments by the guy that's mad about Tesla. <laughs> yes, we have some recent comments on the uh, wireless power Tesla episode that we did with GMA. Can you just characterize a little bit, <laughs> like, for me? <laughs> he is very mad that we are, that he basically was claiming that we don't know anything about Tesla. Uh, and he's angry that we're not all in on the wireless power that's free. Like, it needs to be free, and it would totally work, <laughs> and he's very angry that we didn't say it was free power that would totally work. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, 
people have their opinions. Yeah. So I don't want to be too hard on the guy, but yes, I, I, do. I, I do get a kick out of some of the comments and how they, especially this guy, because he's, you could tell he starts and he's like, there's multiple comments in a row. He he's starts listening the show, to the show and he's like, God damn it. I can already tell you're going to say stuff I don't like. And then yes, by the time we get to the end of the show, he's writing comments in all caps and he's very mad. Yeah. Yeah. That's all on you, GMA. <laughs> <laughs> GMA came here, you know, acting like he knew what was going on. <laughs> and we believed him. Yeah. We got some standard model electrical engineer yeah. to tell us about Tesla stuff. And no. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. <laughs> now to the emails. <laughs> okay. This is from Alex. Or Dead Goat 92 in the Discord. Hey. It's called Making Snaky Ripples. Good eye, Snikes. <laughs> Snikes. S N I K E S. Wait, dead Sna Goat? Snikes. Yeah, Dead Goat. Got one of those right yeah, here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dead Goat right there. Dead Goat from the Discord here. I recently tossed out an idea in the Discord about creating a YouTube channel focusing on indigenous Australian myths and how they relate to historical and geological discoveries in the modern era while also paying attention to snaky curiosities along the way. I'm a snake by night and run a video production business by day, and I have a client in the nonprofit sector, uh, and we have been working with a few Aboriginal groups in the state creating videos with government grant funding. I ran this idea past him, and he loved it and is now implementing a video workshop project with the goal of bringing myth and moral back to a younger, disillusioned generation of today. I'm really excited for, the, excited for this project, not only from a personal curiosity perspective, but to be potentially bringing back some lost culture and moral and curiosity to communities around the state. And I have to thank you guys. Thank you for the seeds of adventure you've planted in all of your listeners' minds. I bet when you started this podcast, you would have never thought the ripples of your musings would reach and maybe impact Western, uh, regional Western Australia. So much love from Western Australia where there is too many goddamn snakes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, bro. <laughs> Thank you, buddy. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Uh, no idea. Uh, I had no clue. Yeah, it still is weird yeah. and amazing. But yeah, that sounds like a great, great idea. YouTube channel. Yeah, can't wait to see it. Yeah. Dang. You got a video production company already? Let's, yeah, man. Yeah. We're trying to do that. It's yeah. hard. It is hard. <laughs> okay, one more. This is a short, short, funny one called Sisters of the Skirptards. <laughs> I know this. I know this. I was not going to read this, Kyle. Like, want, you have, you to, have read to read this. You have to. See? <laughs> he didn't want to read the comments about Tesla either. <laughs> so this is from Tyrell. TR, uh, TRS, the first time caller. He says, top of the morning to you, old boy. I got 71 links on the Electric Universe for you to check out. Any chance you figured out who won the Bigfoot Wars? I recently attended a crystal conference in California and ran into your sworn enemies, the Sisters of the Skirptarts. <laughs> they were talking a lot of shit. Hopefully this aggression will not stand. I told them to <laughs> shove those crystals up their Skirptard asses. Also, I'm mailing you 30 books. Please read them and respond immediately. Your first time caller, Tyrell Rolling Stone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's, it's just a total troll. Yeah, it's totally trolling me. That's all the things in the emails that I hate. Yeah. And he put it all in there knowing that he's like, oh, Russ reads these early in the morning when he's grumpy. I'm definitely going to troll him. <laughs> Top of the morning to you, old boy. Here's a bunch of stuff that really annoys you. It's classic tie. Uh, <laughs> but I laughed, of course. I laughed and hit delete. <laughs> and then Kyle was like, no, no, you have to read that on the show. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Ty. Yeah, thanks, buddy. Really appreciate that. Long time listener, first time caller from like episode three or yeah. something. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> We've never had another caller ever again. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, guys. I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, there will be more turkey material coming. Lots of gobble. That's right. <laughs> Plenty of uh, sandwiches can be made. That's right. From the podcast we're going to be doing about this trip. Uh, so look forward to that in the future. And uh, yeah, thank you guys. We love you. Always have. Always will. Good night, Adamu. Get back to work. Mm -hmm.